Hey y'all, this is a bonus Bible study, totally different topic, requested by content creator True Mystique. Christians, we gotta sweep around our own front door because we're not authorized to sweep around anyone else's. True Mystique did a wonderful video today about how conformity is killing us. And it so happens that for those of you who are in the intercessory prayer uh, study, Bible study that I'm working on, you know, we, we got as of today, we got the first two videos out of six. Uh, you know that Romans chapter one, chapter 12, verses one or two are two of the verses that we will be looking at later on about not being conformed to this world. And the point that True Mystique was making is that conforming to the standards of the world is killing us. Specifically, she was talking about the ideas of hypermasculinity that many black men are adopting, but really come from white supremacy, not from the scripture. Uh, the point here being that a black man in a do flamingo costume, that's a villain from anime, and he has pink feathers because he's representing what? A flamingo. Y'all do know that flam flamingos come in male and female, right? is not saying that he's not masculine. It just means that people do not understand what they are seeing and putting it through a rubric that is based on ignorance. Little uh, ASAP Rocky kissing his own child. Now he's walking behind Rihanna and people have done this massive dissection of that cover with them on there. But the, again, this is looking through, a lot of times we look through broken lenses. And she was pointing that out, being conformed to standards that actually have no basis in truth is not going to be helpful to you at all. Well, there was a commenter, and I'm not going to put that person in the street, but they made what I would call a very standard, indignant, churchy response. Because in the same way that white supremacy informs a lot of what Black men think about as masculinity, as True said, you are stoic. And you can be stoic and you can be angry, but you are cut off from all other human emotion that you have a right to as a human being. A lot of black church people have picked up bad habits from the worst sides of white evangelicalism. This idea that is constantly offended and that we have to always come out here and be in culture wars. Culture wars are a little bit like the Civil War fought again, really, because when you finally finish boiling them down, it really boils down to a whole lot of human beings whose ancestors had control of a whole lot of other human beings. And since they lost that, there's always trying to find a fallback position. Now, I am a Christian. And so if I was to sit down with a white evangelical and we would sit around and talk about, well, okay, does the Bible say this is wrong? Yes, it does. Does the Bible say this is wrong? Yes, it does. So I'm okay running out there trying to do this. No, you're not. Because here's what you didn't read in the Bible. And this is where we get to our Bible study, a bonus Bible study of today. Did you know that the Christian is forbidden to try to judge and control the world? Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, you're going to know it now. Maybe if I can get my, here we go. If I can get my share screen to work here. You're going to know it now. Because see, this is what people who are running from the institutional church have been saying forever and a day. You know, a lot of Christians are very loud talking about what they see as the immorality of the world. But unfortunately, we know from just church scandals in just the past 10 years that this kind of stuff is going on in the church and somehow the churches keep going. It seems like the Apostle Paul in First Corinthians chapter five could have walked into much of the black church community today. That's First Corinthians five. It is actually, and Paul is shocked, but this is very early in the church period. This is not that many years after Ananias and Sapphira just told a lie and died instantly. This is just a few chapters before Paul wrote, y'all need to understand, if you're eating and drinking the Lord's Supper and you don't have your life together, you are eating and drinking damnation unto yourself, and that's why some of you are sickly and some of you are dead. This is just six chapters ahead of that. But it was still a shock in the early church that this would happen. But the sad part about the church today, and particularly the black church where people are so loud, and even the white evangelical church, is that it's not a shock to us anymore. We tolerate this among ourselves. And Paul rebukes the Corinthians here. Now, 
not necessarily this kind of thing, but even the mention of incest. Um, it is actually reported that sexual immorality among you and other kind is not even tolerated among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. Now that is a huge taboo. Um, some of you have heard of the Oedipus complex. This is the origin. That Oedipus complex is the origin of a very long curse word, initials MF. This was considered a taboo. So of all people, the holy people of God, the royal priesthood, as we talked about in our intercessory prayer and Bible study, should not be engaging in this. Even the Corinthians are sitting around talking about, ain't no way. Well, this is kind of important because you know how many of those sexual scandals that we've been listening to in the church have to do with grown men abusing little girls? This transgression of generational bounds was already a problem. And it was a problem in the church that was so big that even the rest of the Corinthians and the Corinthians were doing everything. Trust me on this. Even they were like, how are y'all doing that in church? For 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but especially the last 10 since we've had the internet, black people have been leaving the church and talking about why. And this is part of it. If you watch Dawson Speaks every other week, there is some horrific scandal of this nature going on. And Paul could still come back and say to the black church, as much as he said to the Corinthians, and you are arrogant. So we, we have all this time to put our mouth on everybody else. But we think it's okay for us to keep on allowing these things to happen and that usually the police have to get involved and there's no church discipline and it just goes on and on. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who have done this be removed among you. Paul is like, you need to remove this man. We're not talking about you having the police do it. We're talking about you as a church should discipline yourself. Sweep around your own front door. Now, the apostle Paul is uh, not happy. And as a Christian, we believe this is inspired text. And he's just like, okay, what I need you to do, you are, by the way, this was not a suggestion, actually. You are to deliver straight, point blank. Point blank. Paul said, I've already judged him. I'm a whole apostle. So I'm commanding you to turn this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Let his whole body be destroyed so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, it is so important that this sin stop that we don't care if he catches two, two or three STDs. As long as he gets to the point that he can repent of this sin, we don't care. Okay? Now that's the kind of tough judgment that Christian apostles were doing on Christians. And he goes back to the reminder, your boasting is not good. You know, we, 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 some of you are old enough. Um, Sir Walter Jones talked about this. Some of you are old enough to have remembered James Cleveland and the Gospel Music Workshop of America. And both Brother Leonard the Truth Seeker and Sir Walter Jones have confirmed in their generation that basically those were traveling orgies, y'all. And yet, Black people who were involved in the church scene are so loud and boastful about what we have and what we can do. That went on for decades until James Cleveland died of AIDS, y'all. And then when he died, the pattern stayed up there. There was an article today about the Hilton Holiday Inn in a particular area giving men access to women's rooms and they narrowly avoided being raped. And one was put in a wheelchair and carried back to a man's room. Sir Walter Jones woke up one night at a hotel during one of these conferences and there was a woman in the room. at a church conference. So even the men aren't saved. There, there's even a conversation about in the upper room. Y'all know that about that song, if you've been around gospel music long enough, was cold for what people were doing in some of the more protected suites. And yet people up here boasting, or Kim Burrell sitting up there talking about gospel musicians. And if we had to do this for the money, then we wouldn't be doing it. Just boasting about who she is in her position. Meanwhile, all this has been going on in the church for 50, 60 years. The Corinth, we're on the same page as the Corinthians. 
And Paul then goes to talk about a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you do not put this person out, your whole church life will become like this. And unfortunately, the Corinthians got the messages we find out in 2 Corinthians, but a lot of the black church has not gotten the message. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are really unleavened. For you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. This is a reference, of course, to the Passover. And by the way, I'm not saying they're not individual churches that are not doing the work of church discipline. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying as an institution, Black Christians have become very quick to judge everything going on outside, but we're not as quick to sit pastors down who are acting a straight fool. And this is known. Anybody remember Eddie Long? This is known. Even after these boys came, who were young men by then, and told their stories of what had happened to them, to the day Eddie Long wilted away and died, that man still had 5,000 people in his church. Jamal Bryant has more side babies than we can count, and he still has people in that church. He about to grow weed. He is was barely stopped for hand doing free co doing COVID testing at a thousand dollars per. Nobody wants to call any of that out, but we talk about our big pastors and who we have. Thomas Dexter Jakes has within the last year has come out telling us about, you know, God is the father, but also the breasted one. I did that video and talking about how he injected his seed into the womb of the earth. So if you then look at this, you're like, wait, your God is a hermaphrodite and you're preaching this and you're supposed to be a Christian, but he's also the person that said Jesus is the product. Do you, you know what it means if you make a human being a product? Basically, Jesus is on the auction block of Jesus in the grocery store. We don't, we, 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 we're so proud of having all this, but people know that this is what the public institutional face has become. The leaven has been left in the lump for too long. But in the Passover, God required that the Jews put, kill the lamb, spread the blood over the door, using hyssop, which is a bitter herb, and to make unleavened bread. In the Exodus, the reason is given because they did not have time to leaven their bread because he told them the Egyptians were going to put them out um, very swiftly. So they weren't going to have time to raise their bread anyway. But as you go through the Bible, you discover that that was also a symbol of they were leaving the world behind. And of course, the world that they knew was Egypt, that they were going to be the called out ones. And if you go into scripture and you really study this, the Christians are the called out ones, leaving the leaven of the old world behind. This is how you make flatbreads, by the way. This is when you get rich crackers and things like that. That's sort of the idea of unleavened bread. Let us, therefore, verse 8, celebrate the festival not with old leaven, but the leaven of malice and evil, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Younger Black people in particular, when they go to church, they don't get sincerity and truth from a lot of people. They don't get, they get a lot of malice and evil. But just by virtue of not being able to connect with church traditions that were formed in a South that no longer exists. And I'm not putting down the traditions of the elders. I'm just mentioning it happens to be 2023. But because we have questions and because we cannot, we don't see why certain traditions have to be and even though there are historical reasons they don't speak to us in our lives, a lot of older, a lot of younger people have been through an awful lot of abuse in churches. So this is really a problem. And here's the thing. I'm a professional journalist. I've talked to a lot of, enough old saints to know the abuse did not start in 1981 when I was born. People just put up with it because post pre-civil pre rights, where were you going to go as a black person? The abuse you were going to take in the street was worse than the abuse you were going to get in the church building. And see, we don't want to talk about how a lot of our black churches took that plantation model and ran. The leaven was not put out. The leaven of being raised in Christianity by people who also thought that they were gods themselves and could live as gods over us. We never did sit down and have the conversation, particularly with black men about, no, you don't get to be passive rhymes with massa. That ain't right. We never purged that out. We didn't purge it out of the women either. We never have had that conversation. So this is why you now have people who can now be keyboard warriors going online 
having no knowledge of what's really going on, having done no research, and just vomiting out their foolishness online. Because that old leaven has never been purged out. The purpose of this video is to just help us to do one thing, because I'm now going to come to the point of the video. It is unrighteous for us as Christians to be out here in these internet streets and be out here in these culture wars judging the world when we have not taken care of, as the Bible said, judgment begins at the house of God. There are very, very, very few loud people who are in all these culture wars who go into the denominations that they are in and are going to talk like this. We don't get enough of this. Very few people are willing to face whatever their denomination's problems are, but they're going to have 500,000 things to say about the people of the world. And the people of the world see that and like, ain't nowhere in the world. You're as bad as we are, except you're just not as good at it. You don't have the money. You don't have the resources. You don't even have the satanic backing down right. Now, that's not true of everybody. I heard Cindy Trim basically go, because if you understand that Satan's name is Ha Shatan, she basically invoked him over a whole bunch of people in her church who were listening to the organ and happy dancing and having no idea that that dancing is more related to Vodun than it is anything that was ever done in scripture. But most of us don't even have, don't have, we just out here running them up based on our sins of the flesh, right? And this is why it is absolutely forbidden. I wrote to you in my letter, there is a letter before 1 Corinthians, we just don't have it. Paul wrote three in total, we do not have the first one. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and the swindlers or idolatry since, idolatry since then you would need to go out of the world. It is assumed, of course, that the world is going to have people that act the way the world acts. That just That's assumed, right? We understand that. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed. Christian consumerists are to be put out of the church too. Or an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Now, how do you be a Christian and an idolater at the same time? It's not as hard as you think it is. Um, people who are Christians and at the same time have certain affiliations with certain societies that have patron gods. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, that is an issue um, because you have competing divinities. It is possible to be an idolater and be in it. You can be saved and be an idolater. It's possible. You also can make an idol of yourself. You can make an idol of your pastor. You can make an idol of your husband, your wife, or your children. A reviler. You talk too much and too hard on people. Now, I, I, I'm not opposed to a good drag. Y'all see how I do my drags on here? I, I'm not talking about that, but I'm not going to revile and demean you. I, I might have to put some facts down, but I'm going to try very hard not to go off here. Drunkards, yep, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. Now, the churches that we have today are not, we, we're, we're, most of us are not living up to this particular standard. I'm not saying they're not local churches that are doing their level-headed best. But we're failing on this, and everybody knows that we're failing. And this is where verse 12 and 13 comes in. This is the Apostle Paul. If anybody was going to be able to do culture wars, heck, the Apostle Paul was good at it. When he was Saul, he was out here hauling Christians out of houses and delivering them up to be killed. The Bible said that they stoned Stephen to death, and he was consenting to his death. He was probably the highest-ranking Pharisee there. And he agreed for this man to be stoned to death for work of Jesus. If anybody knew about culture wars, Apostle Paul did. So you figure if he was a white evangelical or even one of these crazier black folks that keep coming up lying after, if anybody was going to do culture wars and be all over the place and be just attacking folk for not believing in Christ, he would be the one. How be ever. This is what the spirit had to say. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. So that when you come let yourself come up online talking about people that aren't even saved and about this, that, the third, the fourth, sixth, seventh, seventh, eighth, you basically are trying to step into God's seat. And that's the sin of both Adam and Satan. 
you trampling on God's property. The Christian is not to be judging the people of the world. Purge the evil person from among you. We Christians have to sweep around our own front door. We're not authorized to sweep around the doors of the world. See, this is the thing. God judges those that are outside. But when Jesus came that first time, he did not come in judgment. Jesus came to save. He said, I am come to seek and save that which was lost. Why did he leave us here? Matthew 18, 9, Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20 says exactly what we're supposed to do. Go into all the world and teach all nations. Everything that I have commanded you, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to share the gospel of God's grace and God's mercy. So we're not here with the world in judgment mode. Now, it, my personal practice is this. Like I, I talked to a Christian the other day, like, you know, they're doing the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know what God did? I said, do you know how long it's been since God destroyed a city because of homosexuality? The person stopped cold. San Francisco is where I live, has been here as a United States city for, for a long time, almost 160 years. Not, no, almost 170 years, 167 years now. It'll be 170 years old in 2026. Before that, it was a Spanish city. So people are going to say, well, it hasn't always been that bad. No, nah, if you go back into the history of the gold rush, you will find out that because there were not many men around here and because people who were of different mind about that also knew they could come here and be safe. You go back and look at the records and you find out that all the way back into the 1850s, San Francisco has had homosexuality. If you go ahead and you do the history of the Greeks and the Romans and all the civilizations that they moved to and all the Northern Europeans that they influenced, if God was going to turn the world into something he's going to do to every place that had homosexuality like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, he may as well go ahead and make it a torch and leave it alone. Europeans have pretty much conquered the whole world. But that's not what God is doing in this dispensation. Now, am I saying that we sit around and we don't resist homosexuality taught in public schools? I'm not even talking about that. But I'm saying that we have this idea that God is just going to fling down judgment and put flames on everybody we don't like or don't trust or are afraid of. Do you know what you do if you don't want your children exposed to certain things? You are the first teacher, so you give them the foundation of what you believe. But when they get to a certain age, they have to make their own decisions. It's just like we talked about Wayman D. Wesley and Ja Morant. Their parents did not raise them to be misogynist. Their parents did not raise them to be up here with some weapon and to be posing with gangster society. Their parents didn't raise them to do that. But at a certain age, they had to be, they have to be acknowledged as free human beings who can make their own bad decisions. You have to look at that every different way. You cannot go out as a Christian. You're not authorized to go put judgment on a society because you're afraid you can't pass your values on to your children. The, the commenter was sitting up there talking about her, their grandparents were such and so. That has nothing to do with anything because that has nothing to do with anybody else's free choice. Now, you see that Bible behind me? I've staked my whole eternity on it. I believe in every single thing that it says. Now, I've studied it enough to know what's for me and what's not. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, judging the world is not for me as a Christian. You want to see it again? Want to see it again? Y'all want to see it again? Y'all want to see it again because you may need to show this to somebody to get them to stop acting a straight fool. Here it is. Here, here it is. We're going to put it up in the center of the screen, y'all, maybe. Here we go. Can I make it big? Mm, can't I can't nope I can't expand the screen you know yeah I bet there was yet I can't expand the screen right now but here it is have a look at that if the apostle Paul was not going to be judging outsiders then I guarantee you you're not authorized to do it as a Christian you're not authorized to do that as a Christian I can guarantee you that the Lord led his first 12 disciples himself. 
He spent three years with them, teaching them and being with them. If you read Paul's testimony, you find out that he was in Arabia and the Lord taught him for three years to get him up level with the other apostles. This is also, I believe, in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians. I have to double check to be sure. So if Jesus teaches you himself and you're not authorized to do that, those of us coming around here, Johnny come lately and, and, and Janine's come lately from 2000 years later, I guarantee you, you're not authorized. Because as a Christian, you're not authorized to do anything that this book says you cannot do. And this includes all this foolishness about these culture wars. And this includes you getting up online, being a keyboard warrior. Christians are to sweep around their own front door. That's it. I can come up here and drag Thomas Jefferson Jakes for preaching a hermaphrodite God because he's a Christian pastor. If he was Deepak Chopra, I'd have to leave him alone. If he was a Greek motivational speaker, I'd have to leave him alone because Hermes and Aphrodite, Aphrodite had a child that was both. Hence, we get the word hermaphrodite. I'd have to leave it alone. What do I have to say to somebody who's still practicing Greek mythology? That's darn interesting since I studied Greek mythology. And because of that, I know the foolishness that we have dragged into American society because we dragged all that stuff. Europeans dragged all that stuff back into currency during the Renaissance. I just happen to know that, but I can't condemn that person. That's not my job. I can, and although I will not do it right now, I could... Talk about Kim Burrell's non-apology. She's sitting up there talking about you not on my level. Excuse me, Galatians 3.28 means you don't get to do that, ma'am, because she professes Christ. I can't talk about Rihanna, Beyonce. That's not my call. It's not my job to judge them. I'm not in charge. God is the judge. And, and, and let me tell you something. I've lived 42 years. Your life goes better when you stop trying to challenge God for his seat. It just does. Now, not all of you believe that. But again, if you're not a Christian, I can't hold you to that standard. It's like Confidence with Love asked me to do a video about covetousness. And we had to get into covetousness. And I had to let her know, since she had asked me the question, that Covetousness has to do with people can go as far as people coveting God's spot. And if you're teaching that your God is born, this is the conflict that you now are in. But that's because she asked me to cover the subject. I can't sit in judgment over her. She's even being, she can believe whatever she wants to believe. That's not my job. Now, if she was a Christian, we're going to have problems. We're going to have major problems. But I can't judge. She and I disagree about that, but I can't judge. That's not my job. We have to sweep around our own front door. I am someone who has had to report sexual harassment in a church situation. That was my job. Details other than that, I give none. I'm someone who has to make sure that the church runs well and that people are kept safe from things like, you know, COVID for about three years. We're now in year three. It'll be three years as of March 14th. That's my job. I have someone who, before we finally went on and got some security, had to deal with the fact that the black men in the neighborhood are acting a fool. And since there was nobody there but some seniors and some children had to go stand up to this man and the power of God and convince him that we're not doing this up in here. My job was to make sure that the older people and the children were protected. That's my job. Now we have security two wonderful security officers from a wonderful black security operation vetted with experience working with Christian people. Just, I mean, again, black men like this exist, y'all. I keep trying to tell y'all. I'm not saying you have to marry them, but I'm saying they still exist. That's my job. To take care of the things that are among you as Christians. That's my job. My job is not to get up here. When I talk about affairs that are not Christian affairs, we talk about them because there are lessons for us. There's a general channel. But it's not my job to tell everybody out here. I can tell you that you are a sinner. But I can only tell you that because John 3.18 says that. Not because Deanne Matthew says it. It's because John 3.18, which I think is back here. Can we read it from here? Yes, we can. Look at verse 18 there for those of you that can see that. That's John 3.18 right there. You see where it's highlighted? Look down. 
16, 17, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he have not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. I can tell you what Jesus said, but it's not me judging you. And for me telling you what Jesus said is not me trying to feel like I'm better than you because I'm a Christian now. No, I was, I'm just, the Lord and I was talking about some stuff today. I have to get cleaned up. Miss D has to get her life together too. I'm not perfect. So I can't sit in judgment over you. And as Christians, we are defying God himself. When we fix our faces and our fingers to be out here trying to damn people when we do not have the keys to heaven or hell. Do you know who has the keys to heaven or hell? I'll give you a hint. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the son of man and the son of God. And as a closing thought, he is not you and he is not me. So we don't get to step in there and be in the will of God. Christians, we got to sweep around our own front doors. That's all we are authorized to do. One of the ways that we help to sweep around our own front door, next week we will be returning to the, to the next two lessons in the intercessory prayer Bible study. And I think part of what happens with us is that we don't understand how how much power we really have and what it is. Every sin that we see people in in the world, there is a reason, in, at least in their mind, that this is necessary for them. People are responding to trauma. People are responding to stimuli. People are responding to things we know nothing about. Very few people that you ever meet. The Bible describes people most of the times as not hardened unbelievers with seared consciences. There are some, but most people are just lost. And one of the things we learn as we learn about our privileges as intercessors is that we are providing a bridge between the power of God and people who are in need to do them good, not to judge them, not to condemn them. But a lot of the problem for us as Christians is we don't even know who we are. And this is why we project on all these other people who are, we are sometimes jealous of because they're more sure than we are. We act just as lost as the people we are supposed to be here to show the light to. And the light does not come from me. It's like there's a light source above me, which is why you can see me. That's the only reason. If you lose the light source above me, I'm not here. I don't glow in the dark. It may sometimes look like it while I'm outside in the sunshine, but there's a light source above me. Jesus is the light of the world. There's a light source above me, and that is who I'm supposed to be letting you see. I'm not letting you see Jesus, but I sit up there talking about how, you know, how how you're going to hell and how sinful you are and how my grandparents did this and that. I had amazing grandparents. And one thing my grandmother taught me, humility. And this is why the Lord was able to use her till she was 93. Actually 94, because she voted for the last time at 94. So the Lord had good use of her all the way down. She lived to see Samantha and I, my sister and I graduate. So really, her prayers were valuable to the day she, almost to the day she died. And I'm sure she had some good prayers that came after that. So how do you stay used of God? Grandmother was one of the most humble people I've ever met. She didn't put on airs. She didn't act like she was better than people. And she knew some sinners. And the Lord was able to use her to show a light to them. That's what we're here for. My grandparents are not going to be a reason for me to look down on you. That's not what we were put here for as Christians. Now, I know I have a general audience, and, and, and if y'all need to vent and put your stories of how you were mistreated by Christians is the reason why you're not, I have to read those and accept them. Perhaps we need to have a record of this because Christian people need to understand that when we do things that God has not authorized us to do, we create pain and we need to own that and do better. So if you feel the need to put them in the comments, 
and I will not allow anyone to come here and attack you. I, I'm, 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 I'm just telling y'all in the Christian delegation, don't do it. Don't do it. I will remove you because we just found out. Did you need to see it again? Before people start posting their comments, before we leave, y'all need to see it again. Uh, don't come into my comments if you were part of the Christian delegation telling people being judgmental, don't do it. And it's not me that's saying don't do it. It's the Apostle Paul saying don't do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. So God is telling you don't do it. So I'm just telling you, I'm not going to have culture wars in my comments. We, we're not going to do this. And why are we not going to do this? Because God said not to do it. It's, it's real simple, y'all. We're not going to do this. But I'll make room for anybody. Share your stories. I'm sure there's Christians that can come into these comments and talk about how other Christians judge them unrighteously according to tradition. And meanwhile, while we're judging people according to tradition, as Sir Walter Jones said it five years ago, other sins that the Bible talks about. Did you see out there we're not supposed to associate with greedy people? In the United States of America, do you know what happens if you put all the greedy Christians out of the church? Hmm? Like he said, some sins are just passing us right by and we're not noting it. But I'm going to leave room for those of you who feel the need to vent to do that. And we are not having culture wars in the comments. Period. We're not doing it. First, uh, First Corinthians 5, 12 and 13 says we're not doing it. But just take from this, Christians. When we get finished sweeping around our own front door, the light of God that will come through us is like if you have a, a, a lamp and that lamp gets muddy, you need to clean the outside of the lamp so that the light can come through clearly. The Lord Jesus has no problem bringing people to the light. And if I, if I be lifted up on the earth, will draw all men unto me. He has no problem doing that. But it is very important for us right now to get ourselves in order, to look at the biblical standards for our life and behavior, and to focus on removing the evil that is among us. On a personal level, we all have things we have to do in our lives to get them together. There's things we need to do. And then... When we have done that, the Lord will continue to draw whoever he wants. And then we will be able to stop this foolishness that is going on within our gates. The sin in our lives makes it very easy for us to excuse the sin inside the church because we don't want to get called out either. When that stops, and like I said, I know some churches are better at this than others. I'm in a church that does serious church discipline and the church is healthier and growing. Then we were able to attract people from outside who truly want holiness, who truly want to be in an environment where they can grow and put their past behind them and be supported instead of constantly being judged, but now begin to walk with God. My church has some people that their past is, wow, but now they're able to walk with God. They're not associating with people that are going to tempt them to go back into old habits. This is important. All this is important. When we do it the way the scripture says to do it, beautiful things can happen. But we got to stop pointing the finger to everybody else. You know, you know, black men pointing the finger at black women, black women pointing the finger at black men. Christian church and, and, and all these people had a grandmother who was a church going woman and, and that's the habits. Well, it's been a habit in the church for a minute. But we must sweep around our own front door. That is all God has called us to do. All right. You don't have a good day now. Sweep around your own front door. And thank you for listening. Goodbye.